Like you. A little piece on it. It's a bipedal, violent flower, bilaterally symmetrical. That means it has a left and right side, and it has bushy stamens inside that look like a beard. And you eat the leaves and the flowers. So the violet um, evolved fairly recently in natural history. Um, what happened was that the Zeus, the king of the gods, got bored on Mount Olympus, living forever. Anything you do, you've already done a million times before. So Zeus got bored on Mount Olympus and uh, decided to come down to Earth and have some fun. He used his magical powers to disguise himself as a handsome young man and went into the woods. There he met a wood nymph by the name of Violet, and they started partying in the woods and had a great time until Zeus got uh, very nervous, very worried, very scared. Why would he be scared? Well, what is his wife Hera found out what was going on? Zeus, how dare you? You're married to me or not married to her? <laughs> <laughs> You've embarrassed me in front of all the other gods and goddesses. I'm not going to forget this if I live forever, and I do live forever. You're going to be washing the dishes for the next million years. If you want to party in the woods, you party with me. <laughs> So well, Zeus used his magical powers and turned Violet into a cow. <laughs> he figured his wife would never guess that he was partying in the woods with a cow. <laughs> a sheep maybe, not a cow. Uh, anyway, at the end of the day, Zeus, uh, um, Violet got hungry after Zeus went home. And now she was a cow. She needed some food. So she started eating the grass. Moo, moo, moo. But the grass was tough. It hurt her poor little mouth, and she started to cry. Moo, 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 moo. And Zeus felt sorry for her and turned all her teardrops into violets. Oh. And, uh, that's the story until recent times when my violet was born. And she now knows so oh. many plants that if anyone turns her into a cow, she'll know what to eat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you put the violets into salad, the leaves and the flowers. You put them into soups. You put them into casseroles. You stir fry them. The last thing I did with violets just this morning before I left, I had a quart of, uh, a quart of violet leaves and flowers. Uh, I cooked them in a uh, vegan butter that you get in the health food store made out of olive oil. Uh, it doesn't have all the cholesterol of commercial butter. Um, and it's better for the cows, better for factory farm cows. Uh, so I sauteed, oh, first, first I, I cooked an onion in the, uh, in the fake butter for about 10 minutes until it was translucent because that cooks longer than the violet. Then I added the violet, and I wanted to make it a sweet recipe. So I added cinnamon, uh, clove, wild ginger, and a dash of almond extract, and then uh, uh, sauteed that for another 10 minutes and made a really wonderful vegetable dish. Okay, now there's also a white violet, um, and the white violet, and the, that used to be a separate species, and the white violet, and the blue violet hybridize and make one that has blue and white on the flower. Uh, but now they're all uh, considered the same species. What is the basis of when, uh, when botanists decide the two things are the same species? What did the two species just do? Yeah, if they can reproduce with each other and create viable offspring, then they're, then they're a separate species. The only similar bark is cherry bark, which uh, has larger cracks and has a totally different smell. The leaves are alternate. They're single. They're not in pairs. And what we're going to do is pass out some twigs. A big tree like this can certainly spare a bunch of twigs without being harmed. Break this into little bite-sized pieces and pass, pass it around. And let's see who's the first who can tell me what it tastes like. You, this is what the Indians <laughs> use for chewing gum. Oh, yeah. oh,
Here you go. It's a silver or black? No, it might be silver. I always have trouble I'm, I'm not trying to correct you. I have no idea. Yeah. What is that? Oh, okay. I'll, st I'll be still in a minute. <laughs> I think this is black, not silver. I use stevia as the sweetener, and I put in some orange rind and some fresh, uh, the scrapings of fresh vanilla bean, and it makes a wintergreen jello. So the chemical that you're ta the natural chemical you are tasting, is uh, methyl salicylate, otherwise known as, otherwise known as oil of wintergreen. Uh, methyl. If you hear the word salicylate, what kind of medicine do you think of? Aspirin. Do um, yellow birch in the same way? I don't think it has the, doesn't have the flavor. It's the black birch, which is indigenous to the northeast, um, that, uh, that really has enough of the wintergreen that you can smell it. Uh, trees can communicate. Um, let's say there are some uh, nasty plant-eating insects that are drilling holes into the black birch tree. Uh, the black birch uh, will then release the smell of oil of wintergreen. Which way will the smell go? If you stick your hand up in the air, you should be able to feel which way it's going to go. <coughs> what? It will go in the direction of the wind. Okay, so there's this black birch smell going in the direction of the wind, and then a predatory insect smells black birch. Um, and we can assume the predatory insect downloaded my app. Uh, and knows what it's doing. What, if you were a predatory insect, what would you do? Use that as a food indicator. Yeah, and which way would you fly? Into the wind. And sooner or later, you get to your quarry, and the, uh, so the birch has actually communicated to the, uh, to the insects, and the ones that are the best at communicating are the ones that get rescued the most quickly and have the greatest uh, uh, survival survival benefit. And there's, there's some evidence that when plants are injured and they start releasing these signal, signaling chemicals to, um, uh, that signal insects to come to them, that uh, other trees react by producing more of the chemicals that they need to protect themselves from the insects. So there, there is a lot of communication. And what has not been studied yet is what's going on underground because there's a tremendous ecosystem underground with uh, networks of fungi uh, getting food from the trees and controlling the growth <coughs> of the trees and making them healthier so they get more food. And whatever the, the fungi are doing uh, in, in these kinds of situations, we still, we still haven't, uh, haven't figured out. There are acacia trees in Africa that house ants and they have nectaries and they provide food for the ants. If an elephant comes and starts tearing off the branches and eating the, uh, eating the tree, where do you think the ants go that is not somewhere an elephant wants to have them? Into its trunk and they bite. So, uh, and scientists have removed all the ants from some acacia trees and left the other acacia trees alone. And it's the ones where they remove the ants that get eaten by the elephants, and the elephants know not to go somewhere where they're going to get stung in the trunk. So this is, it's all, there's all new stuff to discover. I've been foraging, uh, teaching foraging for 31 years, and I'm always, I'm always learning new things. And uh, I'm sure I've only uncovered a fraction of what there is to know about these plants. Remember what I call the configuration where the leaves grow in a circle at the base of the plant? That's called a basal rosette. This is the first year burdock. It forms a basal rosette, and it has these large wedge-shaped leaves that get about five times the size you see them now. And unlike similar plants, look at the underside, it's whitish. If you look at it really closely, you'll see very, very tiny hairs on it. So this is burdock. The, and the leaves are delicious, but only if you're a goat or an iguana. <laughs> and they are deadly if you're an African gray parent. I know that because a little bird told me. I did a tour for a flock of parrots, the only interspecies tour I ever did. A parrot club called me up and they hired me to do an outing in Central Park for them and their birds. They were very nice people. They uh, lent me a book on the care of African gray parrots that said that the, uh, 
um, burdock leaves will gum, will, uh, the hair on the burdock leaves will gum up their digestive tract and kill them. And we did the tour, they paid me well, but they were so uptight they wouldn't try a single thing. They wouldn't try mulberries, they wouldn't try wood straw, absolutely nothing. They were not foodies and they were very uh, retro in their approach to food choices. So I finally gave up on them and started showing the plants to the parrots. And the <laughs> parrots paid attention. Uh, they even came up with their own tricks. There's a, a fruit that comes from Turkey called the carnelian cherry. You've eaten those, haven't you? Very, very tasty. Well, they would take this this uh, red berry in, in one in their in their claw, hold it up, and then peel it with their beak and eat. And these were gourmet parrots. <laughs> so, uh, very, very cool. Very smart animals. So, with burdock, three things you need: moist soil. Don't bother with this if there's been a drought. Shovel is much better to use than a hand trowel. And third thing, you need a place where there are no rocks. You can't see the rocks, but if you start digging and there's rocks, burdock is everywhere. Once you recognize, just go somewhere else. Under pine trees, the soil is usually particularly soft. Let's see what we get here. I want to pull it up. Okay, go. Okay, Violet's going to get the burdock up. And uh, yeah, see if you can get the root out. There it is. Put the soil back. That's the first year burdock, and if you smell it, it smells like to date potatoes and dirt. So you take a scouring brush, and we didn't get the whole thing. We cut it in half, so it's going to regenerate. Thank you. You scrub the root with a scouring brush, a scouring pad. Slice it razor thin. If you have a food processor, use that's that's when you use the, the finest cutting blade. And uh, for best results, you cook it in moist heat, something that includes water. So a pot of rice is soup. Uh, you can steam it. Uh, once you can stick a fork through it, it is done. If you saute it, it doesn't get soft. Uh, so for example, a really good Japanese. Uh, they, they grow this as a food crop in Japan. A really good Japanese recipe is called kimpiri gobo, or kimpira gobo. You uh, saute the slices in peanut oil or sesame oil with slices of ginger and carrots for about 10 minutes. Then, because it needs the liquid, you add some wine and some tamari soy sauce. That's a high-grade soy sauce you buy in health food stores. Um, Commercial soy sauce would work too, but it's not as good. Cover it, turn the heat down to low, and let it uh, let it cook with the liquid for about uh, another 15 minutes. When you can stick a fork through it, it is done. You sprinkle on some toasted sesame seeds, and they, they do serve kimpira gobo in a Japanese restaurant. Very, very tasty, and just a wonderful combination of uh, ingredients. If you like hot sauce, you can put some hot sauce. Uh, it's a biennial. The second year, like the garlic mustard, it develops a stem. When the stem is still uh, soft and flexible, uh, usually end of May, early June, you cook off the stalk, peel it, slice it. It's bitter, but if you parboil it, boil it in water, salt and water for one minute, the bitterness is gone. And then it tastes like artichoke hearts. Oh. And you can use it in any recipe, uh, any, any vegetable recipe, that uh, where artichoke hearts would be flavorful. Again, soup, stews, um, uh, you can cook it with uh, tomatoes, throw in, some, throw in some rice, add a little lemon juice and olive oil, and let all of that simmer, uh, uh, and some, some lentils too. And then you have a Turkish uh, uh, lentil casserole with, uh, not really artichoke hearts, but the same, the same flavor. It's just one I just made up that I wanted. Yeah, you don't need to buy it in Whole Foods. You get a shovel, you look around, it likes disturbed habitats, edges of trails, just don't pick where there's heavy traffic. It has these very, uh, the leaves that are wedge-shaped and whitish underneath, and then it has the tap root that's, uh, once you scrub it, it is white. Well, there's always going to be some first year and some second year mm -hmm. plants, and it depends whether you want the root. The uh, Asian people want the root. The Italian people want the stem. Again, the app is Wild Edibles. You can download it from the iTunes store or Android. So if anyone has a neighbor they don't like, 
Cure the seeds. Throw the seeds on your neighbor's lawn. And then the next year, make friends with a neighbor and tell them you'll get rid of all these awful weeds in their uh, awful weeds in their yard. Uh, this is the time to get the dandelion flowers because they're all blooming now. Later in the year, you'll get a few oh, yeah. blooming and a few old ones that are, uh, that are way past their prime. If you want to collect dandelions in quantity, look for a, um, a sunny open place that hasn't been sprayed where you see tons of them and then get them all. As I said, this is an incredibly dangerous plant. I ate one leaf of a dandelion. 4 p.m. Um, on <coughs> March 29th, 1986, and a couple of minutes later, I could not move my arms. Uh, it turned out we had undercover park rangers on one of my on, on my uh -huh. major tour of Central Park. It was a man and a woman. They said they were married. They never held hands or kissed, so I figured they'd been married a long time. <laughs> the man kept taking pictures. I'd hold up the specimens. Only I was the specimen. At the end of the tour, I showed people you could eat the leaf of the dandelion. I ate the dandelion leaf. The male ranger ducked behind a tree. All right, there he is on 84th Street. Go get him. Every park ranger in New York City popped up from behind the bushes. They handcuffed me, and that's why I couldn't move my arms. In case I was going to bop them on the head with a dandelion. They searched me. I don't know if they're looking for weeds or weed. <laughs> but they hauled me off to the police station in handcuffs where they took fingerprints, mug shots. They even searched my backpack. Fortunately, I'd eaten all the evidence. <laughs> then they issued me a desk appearance uh, ticket that said I had to go to court and could face up to a year in jail. I was charged with criminal mischief for removing vegetation from the park because I had eaten a dandelion. Um, after that, they made a very bad mistake. They let me go. I used to play in chess tournaments. I'm a pretty good chess player. I've even beaten a master once. Uh, so what you do when your opponent makes a mistake is you figure out why it's a mistake and how to <coughs> exploit it, and you have to make the right move right away. Um, I spent, the, this was before the internet, I spent the next day on the phone uh, calling every newspaper, TV station, wire service. Um, they all turned me down, except Associated Press put me on page one of newspapers around the country. And then suddenly all the people that hung up the phone on me the day before were coming after me. I got five minutes on CBS Evening News with Dan Rather. Um, I, I got a, on the Letterman show a, a while later. I was on the Today Show. Uh, I was on the BBC in London. The poll by the strike is in its fifth week, and in New York City, they arrested the wild men of Central Park for eating a dandelion. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't walk down the street without people stopping to shake my hand. When they took me to court, I served wild man's five borough salad with vegetables from the wild vegetables from the five boroughs of New York City and my own salad dressing on the steps of the Manhattan Criminal Courthouse. The press ate it up. I got in all the newspapers and TV stations again. Uh, the Parks Department was so embarrassed by the world-class negative publicity that they negotiated with me, dropped the charges, and hired me. And I taught foraging for them for the next four years. <laughs> oh, my God. And left when the administration changed. Um, years <laughs> later, the man who uh, was the last Parks Commissioner, Adrian Benepe, and I met. Neither of us were working with the Parks Department then. He became commissioner later. Uh, he told me the reason, the real reason they arrested me was they were afraid of the boogeyman of bureaucrats. And that is uh, lo litigation, lawsuits. They were afraid that if they tolerated foraging, someone would pretend to have poisoned themselves foraging and sue the city. And then just last year, I was doing a tour for a uh, law association. They told me, well, if you're, if you're arrested for reasons other then what they give, that's false arrest. That was 26 years before, so too late to sue the city, and it all worked out really well. Anyway, now they, now they uh, badmouth me in the press when someone writes a nice blog, but they haven't come after me since 1986.
That's my story of the dandelion. Beware of undercover agents. <laughs> Uh, here's something growing right next to it. This is common plantain. It has oval leaves, parallel veins, and grows in a basal rosette. The leaves are not my favorite. They taste like wheatgrass juice. Every, anyone who likes wheatgrass juice can taste them. Both of you. <laughs> And this is an incredible medicinal herb for skin irritations. It, it contains like a whole slew, I'd have to look at my app to read you all the chemical names, a whole slew of biologically active compounds. If you get a mosquito bite, you take a bunch of leaves, mash them up, and rub the juice on the mosquito bite. You have to do this very soon after you've been bit. And you do this repeatedly so the bite stays wet for 15 minutes and you will be cured. Very, very effective. So this is an invasive European plant. It's good for any kind of skin irritation. Uh, bee sting, it won't cure. But if you get stung in two places and you use the um, common plant on one, it's probably uh, about 80% reduces the severity of the bee, of the bee sting. Uh, it even made two people very rich. Once upon a time, there were two brothers, and one of the brothers got a cut on his finger. Oh, my God. There's blood. There was nothing. Bleeding. The other brother says, here. Take this leaf, wrap it around your finger. Thank you, brother. It worked so well that the two brothers invented something to put on cuts that made them very rich. What did they invent and what are their names? Johnson and Johnson. Yeah, common plantain inspired the Johnson brothers to invent the Band-Aid. And it's paradoxical because this is a medicinal plant. And after people in America and other countries figured out, hey, you know, you could make money selling sucker stuff that's normally free, and they'll pay for it. Uh, that, that, started the, uh, that started the whole pharmaceutical... Uh, um, the uh, industrial the revolution business. And then the herbs went out of favor. And uh, the herbs are still great. Uh, uh, this has been analyzed and it does have the biologically active constituents. A lot of herbal remedies have not been analyzed because the drug companies don't think they can make a lot of money out of it. So you're never quite sure which herbs work the way they're supposed to and which don't because you get a combination of both. I know for a fact there is no herbal remedy for baldness that works. <laughs> and I also know for a fact that for people who um, uh, mosquitoes love, like me, none of the, uh, from garlic to um, um, catnip oil, which I've sprayed on me, I get a big following of both cats and mosquitoes. Uh, none, of, none of those things work, whereas other things do work. And the pharmaceutical uh, business makes some really good life-saving things, and at other times they just want to make, uh, make money. So uh, they bias the uh, experiment. So there's a lot of chicanery going on, and uh, I think your best your best bet is prevention. Eat a healthy diet and exercise, and um, then then you're a lot safer. This one is called winter crest. It starts as a basal rosette with these lobed leaves, they're shiny, and it has paired lobes, and then the lobe at the end is uh, sort of kidney-shaped and larger. And then it gets tall and has flowers. The mustards have four petals in the shape of a cross. They haven't opened yet, uh, though you can see on the garlic mustard, four petals in the shape of a cross. And this is the least favorite of all wild foods because it has a bitter aftertaste. Um, the basil leaves can be good when they first come up like one week in late winter. I've only found them once in a stage where they were so tiny that they were actually delicious. If you don't mind bitter broccoli, you can try 
the flower buds. Or pass, pass them around. Now this one, on the other hand, is very, very delicious. At the end of its life cycle, this is very bitter crest. Uh, chickweed doesn't have these needle-like seed pods. This has white flowers, four petals in the shape of a cross. And let me see if there's anything still tender that you can eat here. Just the Several leaves. leaves of garlic mustard, but much smaller and with more leaflets. Now when this first comes up at the end of February, it tastes like watercress. Who likes watercress? Yeah. Yeah. See what you think. Tops are a little getting hard to chew. We're really too late for these. But we can pass this around. The leaves are the best part now. First of all, it's not bitter. Secondly, it doesn't look hairy. And after 28 years, look very closely at the base of this stem. You can see a few little hairs. And that escaped my notice for decades, because I expected the whole plant to be hairy. But there, you see the little hairs on it? Yeah. At the very end. It has a little hair. So this is a really good cold weather plant. And I put this, I put this in uh, even in curries, and you can still taste it. You can't cover up the uh, cover up the flavor. Now this one, and everyone's stepping on it. <laughs> So Dan, have you ever, uh, this is, this one is called narrow leaf bitter crest. What? You can eat it. I don't find it very tasty. All right, see what you think. I don't like this anywhere near as much as the other mustards. Uh, Dan, what's your experience with a narrow leaf? I would put it at the bottom of the mustard greens. I think it's pretty good, but uh, I try to eat a lot of bitter, so it's not so bad. It's not terrible. Daddy. It tastes a little more like lettuce, too. It's not as pungent and spicy as yeah. the other ones, but Daddy, it kind of tastes more lettuce-y. Here, let's pass it around. Let us see what you guys think of it. Daddy. Eat small amounts the first time because anyone can have adverse reactions to anything. Uh, take kids to learn this. If you are a kid, take younger kids to learn it. The more people out there enjoying the environment, enjoying the renewable resources, the more people we have that are going to care about protecting the, uh, the habitats, the ecosystem, and the species that live there. Last thing I have to say is... That's all, folks, and thank you, Violet, for helping. Thank you. Thank you for coming today.